Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, my name is Johnny, and I am an alcoholic. And I shall be an alcoholic until the day I die. What I tell you today is an observation, an opinion, or a conviction that I have arrived at in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to have to keep it as honest as I can, only because Dewey Spees is sitting out there, and he was there when this whole thing started for me. And I have to keep it as clean as possible because uh, my wife and daughter are sitting out there and Father Charlie's up here behind me. (laughs) And I sure don't want to beat myself out of any indulgences. The right-handers know what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't know when I became an alcoholic. It's not at all important at this point. And how I became an alcoholic is a matter of who is making the analysis. Now, when I say I'm an alcoholic, that means there are some things that I am not. I am not an ex-alcoholic, and I am not a cured drunk. And if there are any of the professionals in the crowd... I shall say, for your benefit, consider me an arrested case of dipsomania. But when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, there was nowhere else to go. Uh, I have been assured that it is not hereditary, uh, although uh, I suppose heredity and environment has something to do with it. But I would rather believe that just falling down the stairs in the neighborhood taverns when I was drunk going to the latrine had something to do with it, too. It really softens your head up. But until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was the smartest man I had ever met, met anywhere. I had never made a mistake. I had my first experience with Alcoholics Anonymous on my 15th birthday. I, uh, at that time, my father had a business, and uh, he was out of town, and I was in charge, and it, uh, being 15, I felt I could grow up, and so I did two things that indicated to the whole world that I was grown. I put on long pants, if that dates me, you know, there's nothing wrong with black stockings. I'm that old. I put on long pants, which led me in the front door of the pool room, and I bought a pint of corn whiskey. In those days, we had two choices. You heard Alan talking about it last night. Dago Red and corn whiskey, uh, pre-prohibition. I suppose I had five or six drinks, whatever is necessary to render a 15-year-old punk paralyzed, and I got paralyzed. And I got sick. And I got well. And I think that until my entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous, every time I drank after that at first experience, I was looking for the release from reality, responsibility, and life as it is to that great alcoholic haven of life like I wanted it to be. Because when I was drinking, I was in charge. And I said who would wear the white hats and who would wear the black hats. Until, of course, I woke up in a drunk tank. Uh, I don't know that the, uh, how much along the line I ever felt I had a drinking problem. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, they told me I was a problem drinker. I got news for you. When I was drinking, I had no problems, unless it was getting another drink. But always, uh, pretty much of the time, this was a solvable problem. It was a problem to my parents. 
Uh, they were disturbed about my drinking. They uh, uh, told me something uh, to the effect that I better cut it out or else, and uh, nobody ever paid any attention to what or else. Although there was one time uh, that, uh, oh, I suppose I was a junior in high school. I uh, was a little affluent. We used to pay a dollar a pint for corn whiskey, and rye whiskey was two dollars a pint. And I bought a pint of rye whiskey, and I got awful sick. That coloring was murder. But uh, I uh, thought I had a heart attack or something. Anyhow, uh, my heart was beating out here. I ran home and uh, scared to death. I uh, couldn't get my breath. I uh, was sure I was turning all kinds of colors, and... Uh, they put me to bed, called the family physician. He had a little conference with the family downstairs. He came upstairs, examined me, you know, full treatment, uh, the blood pressure and all this. And uh, he got through and he said, uh, he put a nice pack on my heart. And he left some pills. Uh, uh, the trade name for him is placebo. And he gave me an injection of what I found out later was uh, distilled water in my arm, and he told me that if I ever took another drink of whiskey, I would drop dead. So, in a couple of days, I was up and around, and this bothered me. How could he tell? So, I took a drink of whiskey to see if I would drop dead, and I didn't. And until I came to AA, I never believed any doctor that said anything about my drinking. So that it, there were early signs. Uh, I was thrown out of two or three high schools for drinking. Uh, they got very unhappy. When I would show up to prom drunk, or, uh, of course, uh, the last time I got the band drunk, and uh, they found on that. But uh, <coughs> even those days, People said, uh, you drink too much. You ought not to drink like that. And I said, yes. Uh, the other fellows your age don't. But I said, yeah, I understand that. But, uh, you know, I'm a little sharper. I handle it a little better. And uh, so that it, it was not a problem there. Uh, it became a problem uh, with my employment, uh, too. But you see, you people have to understand me. Until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous... I was the most unfortunate man who ever had been born. Because, you see, nobody understood me. I'd set up a deal and with this brilliance, and uh, and I, uh, I'm i not kidding. I know uh, how brilliant I am, because in the graduating class, with all that trouble, of northern Ohio, I don't know, there were some 20,000 students. We took a, a IQ test, and I ran second. Of course, I think I should tell you that uh, the one who had a higher IQ than I, by that test, was a girl. And her father was a professor uh, who helped to grade the papers. So you know who really was high. So that when I would set these deals up, the other people weren't sharp enough on the uptake, and the thing would all fall apart, and they'd say, it's your fault. But it wasn't really. All I had to do was think like I told them, act like I told them, and everything would work out right. So that you can see that uh, I felt that I was born under the wrong star or somebody had a voodoo doll, you know, putting pins in it or something of the kind. And so that all the time people told me I, I was getting into trouble, and I said, no, I, I, thought I ought to stop drinking. I said, I don't need to stop drinking. I need to get a little bit lucky. But um, I got married, and uh, that didn't stop my drinking. My wife didn't know I was an alcoholic. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. In fact, that was the nicest cleanest name anybody called me in a long time. But, uh, you see, this first job I had was a dandy. And, uh, I, uh, had been robbed of an opportunity for an education, uh, because, uh, I wanted to go to Harvard Law School and my father didn't have that kind of money. So we, uh, settled for the King University in Pittsburgh, which had at that time, and still has as far as I'm concerned, as good a law school as there is in the East. And, uh, I only got two years in. Of course, uh, I, I felt that it was, uh, just unfair to me. Because, uh, a man named Clarence Darrow, 
It was a pretty fair change. It was getting old, and somebody was going to have to take his place. I had no reason to believe that anybody was going to be getting better than I, but along came an economic disaster. It was called the Depression. So you see, all these burdens I was carrying, the Depression, my dad's business went down the drain along with the rest of them. Uh, but worse than that, it robbed me of the opportunity to be a great attorney. But look what it had robbed society of. So that uh, it was always a matter of think big. Uh, when I got married, as I said, uh, my wife didn't know I was an alcoholic. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. She didn't know I drank as much as I did. And I made certain she didn't find out. But uh, it was just like the job I had. Uh, I was uh, working for this company. In a very short time, I was the top man on the list. I was selling uh, a product that was unique enough that I was top man. Uh, my boss started to talk to me about my drinking. And then he started to get nasty about my drinking. And he said, uh, I ought to do something about it. I was one of the... Uh, well, I suppose uh, it would vary 20 to 22 salesmen on the uh, payroll, and I was still top man every month. And he said, uh, these other guys don't do that. Well, uh, I knew they drank. I knew they got drunk because I drank and got drunk with most of them. Of course, that's as far as I carried that uh, analysis because they generally made the uh, office, or at least called in the next day. But uh, anyway... After getting nasty about my drinking, he fired me for my drink. And that set a pattern. It just didn't make sense. Here the guy was spiting his face or cutting off his nose. Because if you're going to fire somebody for drinking, rational reasoning would say you fire the whole staff. And certainly not your best salesman. So you can see, every place I turned, they just didn't understand me. But I told him I would get another job, and a better job. Never got a better one, but I had a lot of other ones. But uh, it always happened that way. Uh, I could learn the job in about two weeks. Might have taken the boss 15 years, you know, but most of my bosses were a little stupid anyhow. But uh, uh, if I learned it in two weeks and... Uh, I'd go and ask them for a raise or recognition or, you know, gold letters on a door or something of the kind, just some kind of recognition of this genius. Uh, he'd turn me down. And then my feelings were hurt. You know, uh, people say you can't sell alcoholics very well. Well, you can if you are one. Because you brush them a little there. You know this spot right here? This is where they wear their feelings. And you bump them and bruise them real easy. And my feelings were bumped and bruised by these bosses. So I got drunk and got fired, or got fired and got drunk. But uh, this was the kind of a pattern. Certainly, it should have shown somebody something. But uh, I got married. In the first year that I was married, I lost four jobs on account of bad luck. Uh, nobody understood me. But... Uh, my wife said I ought to do something about my drinking. And uh, when we were married uh, about a year, first boy was born. And uh, so uh, I uh, went over to see her in the hospital. And uh, so she said, Now, uh, this business of your drinking and what it's getting you into, you ought to be doing something about it. Marriage hasn't slowed you down, but now you've got the responsibility of a family in front of you, and uh, you ought to do something about it. So I thought that over for two or three minutes with a good, clear, alcoholic mind, and decided that I ought to do something about it. Uh, here was a, a girl who had spent nine months uh, of misery and heartache and headache and sacrifice to bring a child into the world, and here he was, firstborn and a boy. Who was I to do less? So I got down on my knees and I took a vow I would never take another drink as long as I lived. And I was never more sincere in my life. But I left the maternity hospital and I went over to my father's new uh, business and I was allowed in that night. 
Uh, in fact, uh, uh, he when he started this new business, uh, he let me work for him for, for I think almost a week. Uh, he had a saloon, and uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't think I shift, uh, finished over two shifts, you know. But they dragged me out from behind him and take the apron off me, and uh, he couldn't put up with that. And then uh, he. Uh, and the family always said I could start a fight in a vacant house. So it finally said, I, I don't want you out in front of the bar anymore. Uh, but uh, this was a special occasion, and I went over to see my dad, and I told him about the firstborn and the uh, first grandchild, uh, first grandson, and uh, uh, he was very happy about the whole thing. And he bought a drink, and I bought a drink, and somebody else bought a drink, and uh, I'm standing there, I look down, I got six Cokes in front of me. The six cokes can scare the hell out of any respectable alcoholic when he's drinking. So somebody said a little bond and a little won't hurt, and I said, no, I don't think it will. So, when I woke up in jail the next day on the other end of town, I wondered what had happened to my vow. I had been sincere, really. Uh, but uh, I, I was just uh, flying blind. I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, one year, one week later, a second son was born, made the same vow, wound up in a different jail. So I quit making. But uh, I finally got that job, the, the big one that uh, we all looked for. Uh, I was kicking around Cleveland on WPA, and uh, I was having a hell of a time with those people, you know, how those uh, federal projects were, anyhow. You only had to work uh, 12 days out of the month. Well, I could never get together with the downtown office, you know. Twelve days they wanted me to work, I wanted to drink, and the twelve days uh, I wanted to work, they uh, said, we don't need you. So I was having a hell of a time, but uh, I heard that they were uh, interviewing for a sales manager for the Eastern Seaboard Territory of this concern, for which I had worked several years before. So I got together some money, I went to Chicago, and I talked to... Uh, the vice president, who hated my guts. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a decided point. Uh, he had no reason to, I, I don't think. Uh, but uh, in any event, I said, you can quit interviewing right now because the record with you, your company indicates that I am the best qualified man in the United States for this job. And he said, yeah, that's true. But it all, that same record also shows that we fired you for drinking. And I said, well, you know, immature you, just a uh, um, uh, young man away from home, uh, making too much money, not able to steward my time very well, and uh, I didn't pick my friends very well, but today I'm a grown adult person, married and have, uh, I think at that time, two, two children, uh, maybe three. Uh, anyhow, we wound up with seven. But... <laughs> He um, he bought it. So I came back to Cleveland, and by this time I told the only two people that were interested in anything that I did how fortunate I had been to land this job. And uh, the only two people who were interested was my father and my wife. My wife said, uh, what is going to make this different? And I said, I'll tell you what's going to make this different. Look, here is a job at the top of the pile with no place to go but up. It represents economic security for the family, and, and most of all, it represents a challenge for this great ball of fire junior executive type that I am. And she said, we'll see. What about your drinking? And I said, no more of that kind of drinking that you're used to. Uh, I don't know whether uh, these people talk about uh, always drinking in these big bars. Uh, we used to do it wholesale. Three or four of us get together and buy one of those five-gallon cans of whiskey, you know, with the wood around the outside of it, and get lost. But I said, no more of that back alley drinking, you know, uh, that kind of drinking. I might take a drink once in a while to promote a little business around the better clubs, but certainly not uh, the kind of drinking that you are talking about. And my father, when I told him, he said, it's a shame. I said, why? He said, they're going to have to do it all over again as soon as you blow this job. Oh, I said, 
Dad, I wouldn't blow a job like this. Look what it represents. This time my drinking is not going to interfere. And all he said was, uh, oh, I said I'd keep it clean. Well, he said two words, and they meant he didn't believe me. <laughs> so that, uh, that's all I got out of him. So, uh, but I fooled him. I spent ten days getting ready to go east. The home office was in Chicago. The, uh, and I was going to work out of the field office in Philadelphia. My territory was from Boston to Baltimore. And uh, so I spent some 10 days getting ready, made reservations, bought my train tickets, uh, made uh, reservations with the hotel, uh, and uh, bought some clothes. And uh, I didn't spend a nickel of our money for anything to drink. And it uh, became train time, and uh, I wasn't there. So they started looking for me, but I came home, I fell on the front door too drunk to walk. So they took me over and poured me on a train. I fell off the train the next morning at the Broad Street Station uh, in rather sad shape. So I got in a cab, went over to the hotel, had a couple of showers and ate black coffee, and uh, it, it just wasn't getting me. So I called the office and told him I'd become a little ill on the train and that I wasn't going to report that day. I would be in the next day. And within an hour of that telephone call, I knew the first names of the operators of the four saloons on the four corners closest to the office of where I was going to work. Well, the results were inevitable. I was there, I don't know, a year, a little better than a year. I wound up on Skid Row drinking denatured alcohol and anything else I could get my hands on behind the packing houses in the 800 block on West Gerard Street in Philadelphia, screaming, this can't be me. I'm too smart. I'm too intelligent. I came from too good a family. This can't be me. You know something? It was. I was jungled up with a couple of older fellas. Uh, we had a a rather elite spot. We were under the trestle. You didn't have to run when it rained. But one had been a former professor of English at Temple University, and the other had been a physician and surgeon from a small town in Missouri. And they were always on my back. You know, kid, why don't you straighten up? Why don't you go back to that family in Cleveland where you belong? And I said, why don't you? And this was before AA. So that you understand... Uh, the attitudes of people, even on Skid Row. They said, we can't. There isn't, uh, we don't have enough left to fight with, because always beating John Barleycorn was a physical fight of stamping him down into the ground. And you get sober and become righteous. And uh, they said there isn't enough left to fight with, and if there was, there, it isn't worth the fight. We have been ostracized by society. We have been thrown out by our family. But you're young enough, you can do it. But uh, I suppose I must have had, uh, well, maybe a thousand fights with John Barleycorn, and I didn't want to go. So it was ridiculous for me to think in these terms. But I think it all started when I went on one of those drunks, uh, and some of them were dandies. I, uh, have seen men, uh, drinking, uh, who, uh, and you can get just as drunk on that as you can top shelf. Uh, once in a while, it's, uh, I've seen men drink, uh, and die. And they passed the bottle when it came my turn, I took a drink. Because I, well, either that or make another run. And I'm a gimp, and I, I was a lousy guy at making a run. So, uh, uh, it, it was justifiable as far as I was concerned, but in coming out of one of those drinks, uh, I looked up and for quite a while, I, uh, had turned away from anything spiritual. And, uh, uh, let me say, I have, uh, spoken before groups where people have told me, uh, be a little careful about mentioning that spiritual and that God stuff. Well, I say to you, if there's anybody in this room for whom talking about God bugs you, buckle your seatbelts. Uh, 
because that's what it's all about. I looked up and said, dear God, there must be a better way to live than this. And out within two days, I was back in Cleveland, uh, very sick, <laughs> very chastened, and uh, I didn't drink for a while, and I am sure that it is because uh, I ran around telling people, and I think this is why it was easier for me to accept these things in AA. Uh, I didn't know it. Of course, I wasn't telling them everything. You know, I didn't want to uh, do real hard time, but uh, anybody that I could catch on the street, I would tell them, look what I did to my family. Look what a dirty louse I am. I robbed the children of an education, a family from uh, economic security, uh, and uh, they'd have damn near died if it hadn't have been for my father. Uh, all of these things, and as long as I could find somebody who would stand still and listen to me, uh, I didn't drink. But pretty soon, you know, I'd walk down the street and I'd see them crossing over way down there. They didn't want to hear it no more. I'm in trouble. You've got to talk to somebody. And I... I knew he would listen. He didn't like it, but if it, this was his shift, he had uh, listen. So he'd go in and put something on the barrel head and tell the bartenders. My de wife decided enough is enough, and I wound up in the court of domestic relations. And so that, uh, uh, for, uh, well, I went down there and they had a big sheet of paper, and my wife told him, uh, you know, this is what the social worker said. So he read it all off, and he said, uh, what do you got to say about that? He made a mistake. He listened to me for ten minutes. When I got through telling him about me, he had tears in his eyes. He told my wife, you're the kind of woman that causes a guy like this to drink. Where's your faith? Where's your loyalty? All this guy needs is some kind of break. You get a job, and he's all set. Well, she didn't know, but we went home, and uh, uh, I was concerned, really concerned, because here I am, this big ball of fire that uh, used to manage this company's uh, money, and uh, I had at least 50 men working under me, all younger than I, and uh, here I had slipped to the point where I couldn't even manage my own family affairs, something was wrong, you know, so I wanted to do something about it. Uh, I didn't want to quit drinking, you know, who, who wants to quit? I had a brother-in-law who didn't drink, you know, and they always say, why don't you be like him? And who wanted to be a nut like him? Uh, you know, uh, he was a pretty good guy, I mean, he was always good for a buck when you needed to drink, and, uh, uh, but uh, I couldn't find him when I needed him. He was always down the street helping a neighbor put a roof on a garage, or up the other end of the street helping a neighbor, or, or over to church helping a minister paint, or taking a... Cub Scouts out in the woods, or, you know, some of those for free jobs, nobody ever got anything out of anyhow. I couldn't talk to him. We didn't have anything. They talk about lack of communication. Uh, I talked to him uh, about horse racing and the coming in reverse, and he thought I was talking about geometry. So who's going to waste their time with people like that? Because you have to go with your friends, even when I was on the wagon once in a while. I don't mean because I happen to be one of those alkies who didn't get fallen down drunk 365 days out of the year. Uh, for uh, 50 or more years. Uh, I was sober sometimes. Uh, I must have been. I told you I got seven children. But I also raised them. We have raised those children. The youngest gal just graduated from high school uh, a week ago Friday. And uh, this is as far as she wants to go. You know, it used to be, you know, seven, one down, six to go. Now it's down seven, no more to go. But uh, we had a reason. So, uh, you know, I had to be sober part of the time. But uh, uh, this deal, at this point, I, I had to beat this drinking rap somehow. So I tried just beer, just wine, just whiskey, just mixed drinks. Uh, just at home, just in a saloon, just by myself, just with somebody, just before meals, just after meals. Just in the attic, just in the coal bin, and I wound up just drunk. <laughs> because for the alcoholic, there is no compromise with alcohol. I know. 
I won't kill. But when I, all these controls were failing, my wife thought, uh, uh, she wasn't much interested in the failure of success. Uh, she wanted the kids to eat. So, uh, I'm back in that court of domestic relations. I walked in, and the guy said, sit down, don't open your mouth. <laughs> He said, I don't much like drunks any, oh, but I don't like smart punks who make a fool out of me. So you are going to do a year and a day in the workhouse. Now, this started the wheels going. If he'd have said, you're going to do a year, uh, because he was going to, the judge, you know, would give you whatever the referee said him. He's a well-named guy, that referee in a, that kind of court. But anyhow, it's, uh, started me thinking, uh, because for any of you, uh, who are uninitiated, when the judge says, a year in a day, you do 366 flat. No eight months or no getting out for, uh, good behavior or no getting out after they get the tomatoes picked, you did 366. And I didn't want to do that. And I think this is where it all started. I said, do you know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous? Now, I had known about Alcoholics Anonymous because uh, the story broke on Raleigh Hensley. He got more lines uh, for being on NAA than Bob Feller got for pitching that no-hit ball game. Uh, that's how it happened. He said he was riding a wagon a mile high. Everybody was having champagne but Hemsley. And all he was doing was crying a little bit and sitting on the other end of the dressing room. But also in our town, there was a series of articles that were being written by a man named Elric Davis, who uh, was a newspaper man who said he didn't have a drinking problem. But it was necessary for him, as a representative of the press, that he be at our meetings. And uh, uh, they let him in at that time. Uh, the meetings were being held on the east side on Mr. Borton's home, a philanthropist. We weren't too well received uh, in all society. And uh, on the west side, uh, then, they got an orchard grove group. But uh, Elric would write about these things. Uh, and they would appear each day in the Cleveland Plain here on the editorial page about ye by ye. And I used to read them every morning that I could read. And uh, the mornings I couldn't, I had my wife read. And so uh, she said, what is your interest in Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, I know a lot of people who need this. So that this is what I knew of Alcoholics Anonymous. At that time... You wrote to a box number. If you knew the box number, the courts had it. Uh, and the newspapers had the uh, box number, and they would publish it occasionally. But I said to this referee in the court, I said, you know, uh, anything about this Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, not much. Uh, he said, uh, it's a bunch of guys uh, got together and helped each other from drinking uh, something or other. He said, there's a book around here. And believe me, it did not look like this book. It was mimeographed. It was about that thick and yay by yay. And on, jeez, uh, they kind of confused me, the uh, pages. It's on 58 on this page. Where it says uh, here, I think this is a much better uh Many of us explain what an order I can't go through with it. Don't, you know, uh, do not be discouraging. It didn't say that in the original book. It says, after reading this much in the book, you find that what we have is not for you. Please throw the book away. So they knew at that time that Alcoholics Anonymous is not for all alcoholics. It is not for all alcoholics who need it. It is not for all alcoholics who want it. But only for those alcoholics who want it and can earn it. 
But anyhow, he said there is a book around town, a book. Around town, and I don't know too much about it, but uh, I said, well, uh, I knew I had to come up with a dandy. He'd heard all the rest of them. So uh, I said, uh, do you think he would help me? And he said, no, I don't think anything would help you. <laughs> so I probably made the best pitch of my life when I talked to him, and he said, go home, and I will send somebody to see you. And this was my beginning in Alcoholics Anonymous. A man came to my house from the first day meeting in the United States, which was uh, at um, 22nd and Prospect in uh, YMCA building. It was for the uh, night workers, they said, uh, but they were bragging. There was only about three guys working all over town. But uh, it was, we were acceptable in the YMCA. They weren't quite sure what we were. Uh, that's how Jack Alexander wrote that uh, uh, article in the Saturday Evening Post at that time that gave us such a tremendous impetus. Uh, there were some things going on around the country. There was a guy in New Orleans that called himself the Great I Am. There was one in Chicago that uh, uh, called himself the Living Flame. And there was... Uh, a gal on the West Coast who was getting those, like Billy Sunday, you know, getting those wash tubs full of dollar bills, uh, Amy Semple McPherson. But anyway, uh, the publishing company told, uh, Jack Alexander, you better investigate this thing and blow it out of water before someone gets hurt. And you know, uh, well, anybody sitting here who's a member knows funny things happen to you when you start monkeying around with that AA. Jack came to curse, and he stayed to pray, because he gave us the write-up that started the impetus for Alcoholics Anonymous. And so that uh, these are the things that have happened before. Now, uh, somebody said, you going to give him hell? And I said, no, I'm not going to give anybody hell. Uh, but uh, uh, I may be here till 3 o'clock. Anybody going to catch a train at that time? Some things that I found out the hard way. This, and remember, this is only for me. You don't have to do it. I don't suppose you could do it. Uh, I do. But uh, I, don't, I haven't seen it happen uh, since, uh, well, I think, uh, since Paul Stanley died. I have not been in a a meeting where somebody stood up and said, you don't have to be drunk to be useless in AA. <laughs> That's what he used to say, and he had his King James Version of the Bible under his arm to back it up. Funny, I get tired of it. Uh, when I, the meeting was, uh, of course, the format was different. Back there, we had a speaker. There were, uh, I never saw a clock in a, a meeting until I got to California. The speaker spoke for oh, an hour, an hour, 15 minutes, and then the meeting began. Because the guy up here, if he said it, he better know about it, he better back it up, and if it wasn't right, he would hear loud and clear. Because, you know, we hear a lot of guys talking, but you know as much as you are willing to put into practice. You know, this is my grandpa used to tell me. You know, I'd start to give him a who shot John Stark. He'd say, hold it, son, you can show me better than you can tell me. So that this is where I got my training. And it, it bothered me, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, because every time, uh, you know, Paul would point, it was always me there, and I said, uh, are you trying to tell me something? And uh, he said, no, not particularly. Uh, they didn't have much respect for me. See, I came into the program uh, the first time. They threw me in the Goonie Roost uh, uh, up there, um, Decoration Day, 1941. I scared Pope poor Bill done to death because uh, I was going to kick the uh, windshield out of his car if he wouldn't buy me one more drink. And I, I was already laying on the floor. But uh, 
uh, they told me I was too young. We had a list of uh, uh, people, uh, 115 names, and my name was 115th on that list. And uh, uh, Homer Ising, Jack Walsh, and I, uh, I was 31, Walsh was 25, and Ising was 30, and they said we were too young to make it. We hadn't drank enough whiskey, we hadn't abused ourselves enough, and uh, uh, so we couldn't make it anyhow. And uh, so I stayed around eight months, and then I went out and proved they were right. But uh, uh, Elmer died sober uh, 12 years later, and uh, uh, Jack uh, was running, uh, last I heard him, he was running a Goonie Roots over in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, don't look so confused. Uh, don't you know what a goonie roost is? That's where they dry out those uh, alkies. You know, they throw them in there and dehydrate them for two or three days. But uh, so, uh, but I had to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I strode into Alcoholics Anonymous in seven league boots. Then I got knocked on my can. So I came to alcohol, uh, back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had my last drink in November 10th, but that's not my dry date, because in those days, the group secretary was Boris, and I went to my group. Uh, the reason I uh, quit drinking on the 10th is because uh, I was drunk on the 7th or 6th, whenever it was, and my uh, number two daughter was born. and. Um, I uh, forgot to go to the hospital and get him. But anyway, uh, when I got out of that drunk, uh, I, I never want to be that sick again, and I always want to remember that drunk, but uh, uh, I was afraid to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't think they would let me back in because we had a pretty good record of sustained sobriety, and they didn't even, a new man, uh, you know, somebody says, uh, where's Charlie tonight? And there's this new guy. <laughs> yeah, and you know what he's going to roost? Two departments. The brand new guys got down here. Dropouts upstairs. Because they had a feeling. Remember, we didn't understand. We didn't know uh, really what we had. All we know was we had each other and we held on to each other. And uh, when you made an opinion uh, or if you had a conviction, you had a few scars because if you said it like a conviction, the guy says, I don't believe that. And I'm not kidding. But you see, what we had, we were, didn't know, but we were hanging on to each other and we were trying. And there wasn't a, uh, these kind of literature books around. There wasn't any of these things except each other. And we had to determine. And we had to depend on each other's stories. When I uh, came back, uh, uh, and I only counted for my dry date, I told you I quit drinking on the 10th of uh, November in uh, 1941, and uh, I was afraid that I couldn't make the uh, holidays, you know, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and uh, New Year's, and I made them all. Uh, but let me tell you something. That is kind of uh, and for sobriety is murder. But I didn't know any better. And uh, so uh, I went to my first meeting after having uh, experimented a little bit and uh, I walked up to the secretary and he said, you're back? And I said, yeah. He said, yeah. Why don't you quit drinking? And I said, the 10th of November and he completely ignored that. And he said, you look like you're sober today. And uh, what is today, and uh, in 1942, the first Wednesday in the week, you can check this, as the fellow says, you can look at the record, it was January the 8th. Now, he took out of uh, a 3 by 5 file card box, which was standard equipment for all groups that had your name, your address, and there weren't many of us had telephone numbers, but if we had a telephone, they had it down there. Your sponsor's name, Wednesday in the week, you can check this, as the fellow says, you can look at the record, it was January the 8th. Now, he took out of uh, a 3x5 file card box, which 
was standard equipment for all groups that had your name, your address, and there weren't many of us had telephone numbers, but if we had a telephone, they had it down there, and your sponsor's name and address, and his telephone number. Now, everybody had a file card, and everybody had a sponsor. You didn't have any choice about it. You didn't even have to like him. If I'd had a gun, I'd have blown my sponsor's brains out three or four times in that first three months. But uh, this is, if this is what it costs, so you go along with what the deal is. So he rubbed out the old date, and he started putting in January, uh, January the 8th. I said, uh, I told you I'm out of drink since the 10th of November. He said, Henry, do you know what liars those alcoholics are? And put January the 8th. <laughs> but I came to Alcoholics Anonymous with a different attitude. I came in the only way I know, on my knees. And uh, the first time I came around, I listened. But getting drunk taught me to hear. So, the first year, I learned two things real well. Sit down and shut up. And I heard it if the guy, he'd go and check the, you know, your dry date. If he had three days on me, he'd give me that business, sit down and shut up. You talk about old timers bugging you. From the beginning, the old timers bugged everybody else. So if uh, they call me an old-timer now, so if you think you're going to get away without being bugged, you're wrong, too. I accept that for Dewey and the guys who came ahead of me. <laughs> but, you see, for us, you got to learn what you got to learn the way you got to learn it. And uh, I was in, uh, I got back in, I got back to work, and uh, I had a payday coming. So you work it how you can. And uh, my sponsor, at that time, uh, his name, uh, I have full permission to use uh, uh, his full name. His name was Jack Kellogg. He'd been sober a long time. In fact, he was sober almost a year. And uh, so uh, I said to him uh, at a meeting, Jack, uh, come here, introduce me to somebody who is sober three weeks. And he said, uh, what do you want to talk to a three-week guy for here? Don't you think I know? You know, I've been around here. Uh, oh, you heard him talking in a meeting. You know, just being around seems to, to make them erudite, I guess, or they think so anyway. And uh, uh, I said, no, I got a, something I want to ask him. He said, you can't ask me. And I said, no, you wouldn't know, wouldn't know. So he said, okay. So I went around and found a guy who was sober three weeks. I said, come here. I got him over in the corner. I said, look, how'd you get by that first payday? Big, real big to me. My wife never knew how much money I made until after I got sober. And it used to be held, you know, when I was, I'd get a six cent raise and try, uh, you know, try to, uh, on the holdout money, take the six cents too. Don't, you know, don't give it to, but uh, this was a big thing for me. And this is what happened. We had to be sober a year on the car before we were permitted to stand in front of a group of any kind, including our home group, to talk to other alcoholics. Because, as what I said, uh, it's, uh, you only know uh, what you're willing to put into practice. And if you lived it, you know how to talk it. So, if you were sober a year, they let you tell other people. And so that, uh, when I was a sober year, they started to let me talk. But in those days, and this is why I say to anybody, ask anybody anything that's in Alcoholics Anonymous. It will not be silly. They will give you an answer. He told me... Uh, Big deal, because uh, he said you got two choices. He said you can cash it at a bank. Oh, I said, "Whoa, that's what they're for," and uh, or you can take it home and give it to your wife. 
well, this was novel. So I took it home and gave it to my wife. And uh, I suppose that was a mistake because I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> but it's worked out much better for all of us. And uh, so that uh, uh, I had to learn as I could from what I could and from whom. Now, I know many people who can give you the 12 steps frontwards, backwards, sideways, and in Chinese. I know, because I have visited some of them in the hospital, and they told me about it when they were getting off the drunk. And I also know some people that know the traditions. And I have been whacked with those traditions. But uh, us old-timers were gaining on you a little because they've got a paper that's called the... Uh, it used to be just the uh, Third Legacy Manual, and uh, now it's the Third Legacy Manual and the Twelve Concepts. And so, uh, when uh, Bill, I suppose, and he had Bernie uh, Smith put it together, you can tell that because... Uh, it takes an international lawyer to understand it because an international lawyer wrote it. But uh, these concepts that uh, when you're whacking the secretary and um, these uh, leaders whom we elect who are res directly responsible to those they serve, they have a right of decision. But in AA, uh, all minorities have the right to dissent. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, you won't find any place in the book, but take my word for it. Every individual member in AA is a minority of one. I know it's happened to me. But to me, I have two programs. Program of sobriety. It's the only guarantee there is in the book. I'm sorry, but... Uh, um, I've been talking too long, but uh, this program of sobriety is in the book, guaranteed. If you don't take a drink for a day, you have to be sober. It's a gold-riveted cinch. But what happens to people, or what happened to me, I was sober for three or four or five months, whatever it was, I, I uh, don't remember the dates, and I went to my sponsor and I said, I don't like myself any better sober than I did drink them. He said, good, now you can do something about it. And so he said, begin to live the 12 steps. I assure you that it was not that long when I took it, because I was... I think uh, Jack said, we'll read the book. And I said, we? You think I can't read? He said, I don't care whether you can. We're going to read it. So my sponsor and I read the book. And he said, now, when are you going to take that fourth and fifth step? And I said, well, uh, what do you think? And of course, this is the old time. He pulled out one of the big watches and he said, well, I'll give you an hour or so. So I found someone who was not in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I did it. I did everything they told me, and I'm still doing everything that they tell me. And this part of it is being up here talking to you on a hot afternoon uh, in uh, Santa Rosa. But uh, you see, I didn't have a personal program. I had the program that belongs to everybody, you know, and so belongs to everybody, it doesn't belong to anybody individually, so I had to get myself a program, my program, my program of sobriety is don't take a drink for a day, my program of living for myself, now I've worked in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous offices and uh, I've had new men uh, and some of the lady luscious too come in and say, uh, I want to get into Alcoholics Anonymous because I drink too much, I said, how come you came today? They said, well, I, you know, I'm sick, or, or I drink too much, or something like that. And I said, you know what, finally hit. This is the day you looked at yourself in the mirror, and you hate your own guts so badly, you have to do something about it. So, if I can very easily uh, handle the sobriety part of it by not taking a drink today, 
then I have to go to work on the other part. You see, I found out when I came to this program that I had never had any problems with anybody in this whole world but me. And I am my problem. And my problem is within me. And if my problem is in me and the solution is in the problem, then I better do something about it. And so I have a program of living, which I start each day by asking a power greater than myself, whom I choose to call God, to help me to help myself so that I can help someone else during the day. And there's a reason for that. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was of less use to the world and society than this podium. At least you can depend on it. It holds the book up. You couldn't do that with me. So my prayer is to be a little bit useful. Now, uh, I make some kind of a conscious effort to do that. And uh, when the day is over, I thank God for whatever opportunities he may have given me to express my gratitude for a decent day's living. What else is there? And that's my program of living. So that I have a program of sobriety, a program of living. And uh, uh, for anybody, uh, it just doesn't make that much difference. Uh, um, you uh, have to put your values on yourself so that... Uh, not that Joe and I were talking about it a while ago. There's a lot of places they don't like me, and I can't help that. But any place where they are, uh, where they don't like me, uh, that is a place where I have stood up and been counted. Uh, I may have been on the wrong side, but uh, I was up there anyway. But uh, for us, uh, we have to do something about our program. Uh, I can't talk about it like the clinicians, and I don't know anything about Bernie's PAC and transactional analysis. Uh, uh, I thought, uh, in fact, uh, I had a happy childhood. Uh, I didn't know it till I was 25 years old and a psychiatrist told me, but uh, it, uh, uh, in fact, I drank on it for a year. Uh, I went to one of the, every, that company used to send me out to be cured. I'm the most cured guy you ever saw. I had them all. And uh, so he told me that uh, I couldn't help it very much uh, unless I could do something about my thinking. The reason I drank was because I threw the turkeys in the creek when I was seven and set Aunt Minnie's curtains on fire when I was nine. So uh, I was glad to hear that. I drank on it for a year. You know, this bartender would say, why don't you, geez, you uh, you're a pig. You drink all the time. Why don't you stop? I said, I can't. He said, why not? I said, I threw the turkeys in the creek. <laughs> but uh, uh, they're not that much interested in that. Uh, I couldn't really, I couldn't tell you whether my mother put my me on the pot backwards or not. Uh, I know this, that uh, I'm the guy that drank the whiskey, and I'm the guy that made the record. And it's a little late, you know, to be bad mouthing the past or anything else. Uh, this is fine. Uh, now, believe me, I, I work with psychiatrists and psychologists, sociologists often. But uh, you, a guy might be able to get us some help. In fact, I know I did. Uh, I went to a psychiatrist. He was a friend of mine. And uh, I told him the truth. Well, you know, that's a change for any self-respecting alcoholic. That Because uh, 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 if you're an alky and you're going to see a, a psychiatrist, you can play him like a banjo. Uh, but uh, depending on what you're looking for. But uh, uh, it's uh, a matter of uh, our own lives. Uh, you, in, in, a, in a meeting, you can stand here and thump the tub and... Uh, uh, but it's within yourself. It's what you live like. The guy said, how do you know that uh, you're happy when you're not drinking? And you know, there's only one answer. If it don't show, he don't know where to look. But this is what I have to uh, keep this program. And people say things about me. Uh, this doesn't bother me. Uh, yeah, it bothers me a little bit, but, you know, uh, what you lose in a codfish, you make up in a mackerel. Uh, some people get fooled, and uh, uh, 
besides, uh, I have a standard. There are two things that make me wholly and totally different than any person in this whole world. My conscience and my concept of God. These are wholly and totally my own. And so it is for each of you. And so uh, when I asked these guys in the early days, they said, uh, do the best you can with what you have today. Well, uh, my employment record will show I have sit on the desk with the white collar and I also was a machinist. Uh, because uh, well, it, was, it served a good purpose. I right? was lose a job, get drunk or something, an uh, executive secretary's job, and then uh, I got so I could, uh, I used to test myself going to, out looking for a job, grab the newspaper and get both hands against you. And when you could sign your name in the newspaper, that was, you know, good enough to, you could work that day. So uh, I used to grab my tools and go out and uh, get a job at one of the machines in a job shop. But, uh, I couldn't understand. They said, you know, everybody's asking questions. Uh, uh, what is my best? How do I tell? And I looked around, and I saw some people, and, uh, you know, I didn't know. Uh, I, I wasn't really happy. Uh, geez, I was working, getting paid. Uh, uh, the neighbors uh, were talking to my wife, and, uh, you know, the, some of the relatives coming over. All of these things were happening, and I could recognize them. But uh, when he said, do the best you can with what you have, I had to come up with this yardstick. This is wholly and totally my own, my conscience and my concept of God. And if I do the best I can with what I have each day by my conscience, by my God, and use this measurement on myself, who can hurt me? Who can hurt me? So, I am an alcoholic. And I am inclined to sit in judgment of my fellow man. I rather suspect that has happened to you. Uh, but because I have never seen any two people in this whole world operating under the same code of moral behavior, I have to keep my yardstick off of other people. So that this, uh, to me, uh, I'd learn to pray all over again. Oh, you'd be here till uh, 5 o'clock if I used all those notes. But uh, I was talking to Father Charlie about it yesterday. Uh, I had gotten away from anything spiritual, and, and I had a real good grounding. But, uh, I had the sisters of St. Joseph in the uh, orphanage and in uh, grade school. I had the Marianist brothers in, in high school and uh, Jesuits in uh, uh, college. So, uh, you know, uh, I've heard guys say they never heard or had any training. Brother, I was overtrained. Uh, maybe that's why I left the, my fight in the gymnasium. But anyway, uh, I again appeal to God. Uh, you see, I was full of fears, and I'm sure you have gone through it. Most fears, uh, the most powerful fears, are when they are most ridiculous. So that I had to uh, get acquainted with God, and so I evolved my program of living. Now, if I do those kind of things and putting my yardstick on me, I have to keep me. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me not to be afraid to live and not to be afraid to die, so I don't have any fears. This is truly so. Because if I'm doing the best I can, uh, that's all there was, you know. So that for me, uh, if I get disturbed, I got two choices. I can remove myself from the irritation, or I can remove the irritation, but I better do one or the other. But I want to be dis uh, disturbed and agitated. Because, you see, when I am doing the kinds of things that makes me want to run away and hide from myself in alcohol, it's not that I'm afraid to die. But I do not want to put in jeopardy my immortal soul. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me one chance to redeem it. I might not get another. And I don't want that to happen to me. And pray God it never happens to you. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.